As the old saying goes, a chain is only as good as its weakest link. So it is with the dam and its foundation. The weakest link or element in a dam or the foundation will determine how long the reservoir and dam will function safely. To achieve a dam that will function safely for many decades, thorough field investigations and geologic evaluations are required. This allows the design engineers to assess the impact of weak elements in the foundation and to design improvements that will make the foundation safe for dam construction. The dam is designed and constructed under tightly monitored and controlled conditions whereas the dam's foundation is a result of eons of geologic activity. Potentially weak elements can exist deep below the Earth's surface. As a result, this can make it difficult for geologists and engineers to locate and identify them. A number of investigation methods can be used to detect these problem areas. Any single method may not be adequate if used alone, but when the methods are used together, they have proven successful in providing adequate information for the design of safe dams. When used together and interpreted correctly in the context of regional geology and geomorphology, this information guides engineers in deciding what needs to be done to the foundations to make them perform to accepted industry practice for supporting a dam and retaining water in a reservoir. This information helps guide the dam designers to excavate, shape, and treat the contact between the dam and foundation, a critical part of constructing a safe dam. It also aids the engineers in determining the best means to cut off water flows through the foundation under the dam. This is usually accomplished by grouting or constructing a barrier element in the foundation that will serve to control under seepage and protect the base of the dam. In many instances, it is easier to carry out these explorations for the design of a new dam than for the investigation of conditions at an existing dam. When assessing whether an existing dam is safe or designing a modification, the dam and existing reservoir can be barriers to investigating the foundation. To thoroughly explore the foundation, drilling must be done through the dam and from barges on the reservoir. Also, a knowledge of how the dam was originally constructed is important when determining as-built conditions of the dam and foundation. Frequently, this knowledge is inadequate, and investigations must be made to assess the condition of the dam-foundation contact and to determine if the original cutoff is functioning as intended. The Federal Interagency Committee on Dam Safety recently invited the internationally renowned engineering geology and dams consultant, Dr. Don Deere, to speak on these issues. His presentation has been divided on two tapes. This tape covers significant geologic features and exploration methods. The second tape covers remedial measures for both dam structures and foundations when geologic features are contributing to inadequate performance of a project. He is joined here today by several professional representatives from some of the federal agencies that are members of ICODS. Dr. Deere has been an educator and consultant for almost his entire professional career. He is a member of both the National Academy of Sciences and the National Academy of Engineers. He spent a number of years on the civil engineering faculty at the University of Illinois. He has acted as a consultant for many federal agencies in the United States and several government and private organizations throughout the world. He has been the recipient of several prestigious awards, including the Golden Beaver Award for Outstanding Achievement in Heavy Engineering Construction in 1990, and the Distinguished Practitioner Award from the Engineering Geology Division of the Geological Society of America in 1993. He was also appointed by the President of the United States to establish and head the U.S. Nuclear Waste Technical Review Board. Recently, he has been involved with the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation in the design and construction of New Waddell Dam in Arizona and has also worked on Pangee Dam in Chile. Together with Dr. Jim Colson of the Tennessee Valley Authority, Mr. Constantine Yumas of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and Mr. David Achterberg and Dr. Dwayne Campbell of the Bureau of Reclamation, I will be joining Dr. Deere in this discussion today. It is my pleasure to present to you 
Dr. Don Deere. Thank you, Frank. In preparing for this session on dam foundations, uh, I found four topics that I particularly wanted to discuss and to elicit responses from the panel. These are weak geologic features, common and uncommon exploratory methods, foundation remedial works, foundation assessment of existing dams. The first three topics apply directly to the design and construction of new dams. However, as you will see, they apply equally well to assessing the foundations of old dams. I believe that the topic for our discussion today, dam foundations, fits well into, into the general theme of this video series on dam safety topics. After all, no structure is better than its foundations. The statement is true not only for dams, but for buildings and bridges. While only a few dams have failed, a substantial percentage of those that have can be related to poor and inadequate foundation conditions. The poor foundation conditions are almost exclusively the result of one or more weak geologic features, be it in soil or rock. Where dam failure has taken place, the dam design team either missed the presence of the weak geologic feature or underestimated its engineering significance to the behavior of the dam. Engineering experience has shown that the safe design of a dam requires an ample knowledge of the weak geologic features present at the site, meaning the position, the orientation, and the properties. An adequate analysis of their potential effects on dam performance using applied rock mechanics, soil mechanics, and structural analysis, and an appropriate design with adequate foundation remedial measures properly constructed. Let us move on to our first topic, weak geologic features. In the late 1960s and 1970s, when I was teaching engineering geology and applied rock mechanics to my graduate students at the University of Illinois, and later to students at the University of Florida, I used the term significant engineering geology features. The objective was to emphasize those weak geologic features that experience had shown could adversely influence dams and other engineering structures. These so-called significant engineering geology features exert their influence on dam behavior because they significantly affect one or more of the in situ rock mass properties of modulus, shearing resistance, or permeability. Four of the features are three-dimensional or zonal in aspect. Weathered rock, the weathered rock profile, fault zones, karstic limestone, and interbedded volcanics with scoriaceous lava or weak clayey tuff. The other two significant features are narrow and of near planar aspect, thin shear zones and master joints. The thin shear zones that are the most prevalent are the bedding plane shears that occur along weak shale interbeds in sedimentary rocks and the foliation shears that occur along weak micaceous, chloritic, or graphitic interbeds in metamorphic rock. The master joints are the most prominent of the joints. They are continuous. They occur perhaps every 100 to 200 foot or 500 foot even of spacing and they may be weathered and permeable. Other features that could be considered for this list would be the pattern of stratification of soil deposits, rock lithology where strength and abrasiveness might be of concern, or the groundwater occurrence. I will now comment in greater detail on the first three features of this list of significant engineering geology features, starting with the weathered rock profile. The profile of weathered rock may range in thickness from zero to many tens of feet, even reaching 100 to 200 feet or more in the tropics. It is convenient to consider the profile in three layers as shown here. An upper layer of residual soil, a second zone of weathered rock, and a third zone of unweathered rock. The contacts between the zones are often transitional and may be highly irregular. The weathering agents, air, water, and organic acids extend deeper along joints, faults, and bedding planes. Also, different rock types will be affected differently. One may subdivide zone one, the residual soil zone, into the A horizon, which is a silty topsoil, 
a B horizon, a Clayton zone, and the C horizon, the saprolite zone. While the upper two horizons are only a few feet in thickness, the saprolite zone may be tens of feet thick or greater. The saprolite is predominantly silt with varying proportions of clay and sand, and it tends to be more compact with depth. The original rock structure and even the rock texture can be seen as relic structures. The weathered rock zone similarly may be divided into zones. Zones 2A, a transitional zone of both rock material and soil material, and zone 2B, hard weathered rock but with much fresh rock but still with soil-like materials along the joints. The transitional zone 2A is a very difficult zone for engineering projects. Containing both soil and rock, it is difficult to excavate and to support. The rock mass properties of shearing resistance, modulus, or permeability may vary greatly over short distances. Dams should never be constructed on zones 2A. Zone 2B, the hard weathered rock, may be acceptable if it is sufficiently uniform and the soil material along the joints is judged to be non-erodible and the hard weathered rock to be grottable. However, it is the zone of unweathered or fresh rock of zone 3 that is the most appropriate dam foundation. The natural groundwater level is often found to occur in this weathered rock zone, ranging and varying seasonally from 2A to 2B to 2A. These zones are also the most permeable parts of the profile. I hope that some of the panel will wish to comment uh, on the weathered rock profile. But at the moment, let's go on to fault zones. The fault zones have been found at almost all dam sites, often only one, but too often, two, three, or even a half dozen, uh, crossing the dam and its abutments. Fault widths are commonly of one to 10 feet, but may range to greater than 50 feet. In dam engineering, fault zones are important because they are continuous over long distances and they contain weak crust material that is compressible and low in shearing resistance. The fault zone may, may be of low permeability in a direction across the zone because of the clay silt sand gouge. However, the permeability may be high parallel to, uh, to the zone in the adjacent rock mass because of fracturing that has occurred related to the fault movement. The fault zone then may act as a permeable drain in one direction as an impermeable dam in the other. These characteristics influence the groundwater flow and pressure conditions and may affect the efficiency of the dam's grout curtain and drainage system. A fault zone may be considered a zonal feature where its width is large. However, it is also a near planar feature with a given orientation, that is, a given strike and depth, and with a specific location at the dam site. The significance of a fault zone depends almost entirely on its location and orientation with respect to the dam and its line of thrust. Some relative positions are shown here to illustrate this point. You will note that sketches A and B represent problems of low shearing resistance, while C and D represent problems of low modulus. Let us examine sketch A in greater detail. Certainly the question is, will the dam be stable under full reservoir? Three important factors will enter into the shearing resistance along the fault zone. The particular dip angle of the fault and the hydraulic uplift not below the dam, but below the fault zone. The magnitude of the uplift will depend on the efficiency of the grout curtain and on the efficiency of the drainage system. Sketch B has many of the same problems, but here the fault is dipping downstream. If the downstream powerhouse excavation had not been so deep, or if it could have been farther downstream, the fault might not be so bad. In its present position, however, the entire stability of the dam would appear to reside in the capability of the piece of rock within the circle to take the complete reservoir thrust. This failure could be sudden and of a brittle nature. Sketch C illustrates a wide fault zone. The potential for differential settlement is present. 
It is also a classic problem in structure foundation interaction. Uh, studies by finite element are helpful in analyzing the differential stresses and the potential for cracking. Sketch D shows a fault in a more downstream position where extreme stresses in the toe could result in cracking of the concrete. Keeping in mind your possible comments on fault problems, let us go on now to the condition of karstic limestone. Karstic limestone refers to cavernous limestone or limestone where differential solutioning along faults, joints, bedding planes, or in beds of pure limestone has occurred over geologic time, resulting in a network of various sized openings. Solution cavities are common along valley walls, back beneath the ad adjacent plateau, and even beneath the river valley. Caves may form below massive beds that can bridge the solution opening. Roof collapse may allow the opening to migrate toward the surface sporadically, forming a sinkhole. The sinkhole usually contains clay, blocks, and other debris from the collapse, from the weathering, and from surface runoff. A sketch is shown here of limestone with solution openings. Note the structural control and the lithologic control of the groundwater solutioning. An area of potential sinkhole is indicated, as is a drill hole, which by chance will indicate good intact limestone of low permeability. The groundwater level has been found at many sites in limestone to be at river level and to rise very gently away from the river usually less than one half percent. Potential for leakage from the reservoir in limestone terrains is always of concern because of the interconnected solution channels. The leakage problem is one involving the groundwater regime. Therefore, a groundwater hydrologist should always be part of the study team. Many reservoirs in limestone have performed satisfactorily while others have suffered leakage of greater or lesser amounts. Close-in leakage is not the only question. Collapse of caverns below dams or auxiliary structures during operation must also be guarded against. Diligent exploration for openings and their backfilling with concrete when encountered are obvious requirements. I think also that we should include gypsum uh, together with limestone as one of the soluble rocks that is able to uh, uh, have some rather cavernous openings. Gypsum, however, is much more soluble and uh, even the reservoir filtration can cause new solution openings to occur. It is now time for the panel to comment on weak geologic features, weathering rock, weathering rock profile rather, uh, fault zones in karstic limestone. I know that several of the agencies have had projects in areas of karstic limestone. It would be of interest to hear of your experiences, particularly of reservoir leakage in general and around the dam abutments, as well as the inducement of sinkholes by the falling and rising of reservoir levels. Um, back uh, when I was in school, TVA was building the Nickajack project to replace Hales Bar Dam on the main Tennessee River and it had more water going under the dam than it did over it and uh, it get, got to the point where it was impossible to control so we had to build a new structure. Uh, we've always dealt with reservoir rim leakage problems. We have a project uh, that we're dealing with currently. It's about 25 years old. Um, we had an extensive reservoir grouting program or rim grouting program prior to first filling. And there were some minor seeps uh, as the, the project was filled, and those have increased over the years. And one of them now is to the point where it's a real problem, both uh, uh, to the, in the public's eye as well as uh, just uh, something that we need to be concerned about. So we're in a very happy situation after having several projects where we've tried to grout unsuccessfully for one reason or another. Um, on this one, we're going to be able to lower the reservoir low enough, uh, we feel, to be below the intake, and we'll be able to cut off the flow of water almost completely, so we won't be grouting against a head. And uh, I'm really looking forward to a much more successful uh, project this time uh, than what we've experienced in the past. But rim leakage in, in the uh, karstic topography is always a problem. And
I think it's always of concern, and it becomes a problem of regional groundwater hydrology. That's where you really need a, a groundwater geohydrologist uh, to uh, look at the regional geology as well as the uh, piezometric levels and permeabilities uh, throughout the zone. And one of the zones that I studied was a zone 100 miles wide. Mm -hmm. This was how far uh, we were concerned about the, uh, the travel of the new higher water level brought about by the new reservoir. You mentioned Nickajack Dam. Uh, one of the TVA uh, projects that they purchased from a small company uh, way back in the early 1900s. I recall taking some of my graduate students from the University of Illinois down to visit uh, that project as well as others in the area. And the thing that impressed me and certainly the students was standing on Hales Bar, looking upstream and seeing a gigantic whirlpool where the water was going down, turning around, looking downstream, and seeing a big surge of water where the water was coming up. It's about the most dramatic uh, instance that I had ever seen uh, of leakage uh, through karstic openings. Uh, I think we probably going to have some other comments on uh, this session. Yes, I th <clears throat> I'd like to add to, to Jim's comments with respect to karstic limestone foundations. Uh, and then with your comment just now about the dramatic uh, leakage uh, that one sees uh, under the situation. Uh, we have a situation where the leakage over many years has been around 700 CFS. Nothing as dramatic visually though, thank goodness. Uh, but coupled with that, uh, there have been uh, sinkholes on occasion that have opened up downstream of the dam. And unlike uh, the TVA experience, uh, this particular dam that I'm referring to has to be worked at under a, a full reservoir head. And what, what's happening now is uh, we're attempting to uh, look at a grouting program, and that program is uh, started in the initial stages as uh, developing a target zone uh, after a lot of geologic investigations to determine uh, what zone to, to begin with and what they can learn from their experiences dealing with that zone. Uh, they've gone through a lot of uh, work in developing a scheme uh, to be able to grout uh, the foundation. Uh, and only recently, a few months back, uh, they, they ended up uh, grabbing a zone that uh, they had a hole down in that they've been grouting. And they continued to grout the hole. And tons and tons of uh, gravel and, and grout have, have been injected into that hole. And it's still, still taking. Uh, so now everybody's sitting back a little bit trying to decide, well, what's, what's the best way to tackle this problem? So there are a lot of uh, uncertainties involved uh, in trying to deal with this, especially with a, an existing dam with uh, a full reservoir behind it. So uh, a lot of people are trying to put their heads together now to better understand what can be done and what would be a solution to uh, assist them in, in plugging this off. I you know, appreciate those comments. Uh, it, it's a very difficult problem and it's faced uh, in quite a number of projects uh, around the world. Uh, are there other comments uh, on other rock types or, or more on limestone even? Uh, yes, Don. I'd like to move to a, a different geology, a sandstone, uh, horizontally bedded with a, a less competent uh, zone of material at some depth below the surface, uh, a site for a concrete gravity dam that also had a near vertical joint system running parallel to the dam axis and then a fault daylighting downstream of the dam. And during the investigation design, why uh, we figured that there would be some movement across that weaker zone. So instrumentation was installed in order to, to uh, look at the extensions that occurred, the, the displacements. And on first filling, the, uh, the load on the dam gave us uh, between an inch and two inches of non-recoverable movement in the foundation due to the joint system downstream closing before the passive pressures came fully into play. Mm -hmm. That's a rather uh, impressive uh, case history. And I'm glad that you had the, the owners had the foresight to uh, instrument uh, the uh, dam so they could measure any displacement. The preceding discussion gave emphasis to the specific geologic features that may occur at any dam site and that may impact adversely the dam's behavior. 
The next dis discussion will address exploration methods used to locate these weak features. Knowledge about the geologic origin of features and something about the physical characteristics of the various weak features will help in planning a site exploration program, either for a new dam or for an existing one. I have divided the exploratory methods into common and uncommon methods. I will review first the common methods starting with geologic mapping. The first stage in site exploration involves a collection of background material to get an appreciation of the regional and the local geology. Such information may be obtained from available geologic maps and published reports of the region, from aerial photographs and satellite images, and from field reconnaissance of soil and rock exposures in nearby quarries and road cuts. A geologic map of the project site should be made showing the overburdened soil, rock outcrops, and rock structure. New aerial photographs may be desirable at different scales to cover the dam and reservoir areas. The photos may be used for preparing a new base map and for geologic interpretation. The goal of the geologic mapping is to allow preliminary geologic profiles to be constructed along the dam axis together with geologic cross sections perpendicular, perpendicular to the axis uh, at each abutment and at the valley bottom. Such an exercise is enlightening in identifying areas where we don't really know the geology in areas where potential faults or deep soil cover uh, makes it very difficult to get the information. The second common method is exploratory borings. Numerous diamond drill holes will be required along the dam axis and along a, dam upstream, along a line upstream and another downstream of the dam in order to obtain a three-dimensional understanding of the site. Wireline drill rigs and NQ size cores or larger are common requirements. For better recovery of weak materials, either four inch or larger cores are preferred using a triple tube core barrel. The information to be obtained for the, uh, from the borings includes the following. Thickness and kind of overburdened soils, kind and quality of bedrock with depth, the presence, orientation, and physical characteristics of joints, faults, and the profile of weathering, the permeability by Lefranc and Lujon infiltration test, and the depth to the water table. Careful core logging is necessary to determine the soil and rock types, the rock structure, and the general rock quality, for example, by the RQD method. With the new drill hole information at hand, the previous prepared geologic profiles and sections can be corrected and updated. Whatever geologic weaknesses that occur at the site should now be known. Additional borings may be programmed to define boundaries and to fill in data between the first borings, where, of course, we may discover additional weak zones. The dam design team can now study the feasibility of different dam types, the layout of the dam and pertinent structures, and the possible extent of foundation excavation and treatment. The dam engineer, together with the engineering geologist, can identify the areas needing additional study by borings or other procedures. Our third common method of excavation, or is the excavation, of exploratory trenches and test pits. Trenches and pits excavated by bulldozers, backhoes, or occasionally by hand are commonly used for investigating the kind of overburdened soils, their thicknesses, and their pattern of stratification. They are useful in determining the depth to the water table and the details of a weathered rock profile. Their obvious advantage over borings is the three-dimensional picture that they provide and the opportunity for detailed sampling and for in situ testing if desired. The depths of these excavations are limited by the equipment capabilities and are usually less than 50 or 60 feet. Geophysical surveys comprise the fourth method of exploration. Geophysical surveys by refraction or reflection seismic methods and by various types of electrical resistivity procedures have been used at a high percentage of dam sites. They are occasionally done before the borings 
to estimate the bedrock depth, formation contacts, or groundwater depth in order to aid in developing the boring program. However, I believe the geophysical surveys may be used more efficiently after the boring program is well along to fill in data between borings. The big advantage is that the boring data are available for calibrating the geophysical results, thus giving more credence to the interpretation of later results. Uh, the exploration methods that I'll discuss now are less commonly used, but there are methods that can provide significant additional information. The use of shafts and adits as exploratory methods is simply an extension of the more common method of trenches and pits. They are deeper, longer, and often require rock blasting. Consequently, they are more time consuming, more expensive, and are therefore used less often. However, exploratory adits are excavated for nearly all concrete arch dams and for many concrete gravity dams, usually two or three on each abutment to depths of 50 or 250 feet. They are valuable for investigating the depth of weathering and de-stressing in the abutment, assisting in determining the foundation depth for the dam under study. On a number of important embankment dams, exploratory adits have also been uh, excavated for the same purpose. The adits for both embankment and concrete dams can be located so as to be incorporated in the abutment drainage system. The characteristics of fault and shear zones can best be determined by exploratory adits, crossing them or following them along their strike direction. Critical observations may be made as well as in situ rock mechanics tests or seismic velocity measurements uh, along the adit or between adits, if desired. At several projects, fairly deep exploratory shafts have been excavated, particularly for investigating a fault or shear zone or a deep profile of weathering. Occasionally, an adit has been driven under the river from the base of the shaft. Where rock mechanics tests may possibly be desired, the shaft or adit allow access and also the opportunity of choosing the most appropriate part of the feature for testing. For example, I like to do in situ modulus test or direct shear test at three locations along a particular weak geologic feature, representing the worst condition, an intermediate condition, and the best condition. A number of specialized geophysical methods have been developed over the last few decades that have been applied to dam site investigations to a limited extent. These include microgravity, ground penetrating radar, and electromagnetic methods. All three methods have had some success in discovering solution cavities in limestone and fault zones in any rock type. I believe that we may find these types of surveys used more in the future, probably in combination with each other or with other geophysical methods and with the boring program. Special groundwater studies in certain conditions may be required. There are certain geological conditions involving particular stratigraphy or complex geologic structure that may merit large-scale pumping tests. These have been done on several projects in recent years, for instance, to investigate possible reservoir leakage across a divide. Multiport piezometers, which allow piezometric levels permeabilities, and even water sampling to be obtained at a number of depths in the same drill hole have been used as control piezometers in the pumping test. They also have been used to monitor groundwater changes in abutments and reservoir slopes with the filling of the reservoir. I believe that we will see increasing use made of these in the future. Considering the early excavation of the dam foundation as an exploration method may seem to be stretching the point. Nevertheless, in areas of complex geology, where the results of each boring or each geophysical line leads to new interpretation and further uncertainty as to the appropriate foundation grade, pre-excavation by an early and separate contract may be the preferred method of exploration. In employing this procedure, sufficient exploratory work must be done to allow an approximate excavation depth to be selected. A contract is then prepared on the basis of this assumed excavation depth. A contract is then prepared on the basis of the excavation limits, 
with the excavation width some 20 to 30 feet wider than actually required so that the final position of the axis of the dam can be moved somewhat if desired. The excavation is conducted in two stages. The first stage includes the overburdened soils and the weathered rock that can be removed by dozer, ripper, and backhoe. The exposed harder rock is cleaned up to allow geologic mapping and possibly a few shallow drill holes or geophysic lines to be carried out. The design team then prepares geologic cross sections at each dam block with the new design depth for the foundation for that dam block. Frequently, it is a stepped foundation level. The excavation contractor then proceeds with his second stage of rock excavation using controlled blasting. Minor changes may be made during this stage in accordance with local variations in the rock. Frequently, dental excavation along a fault zone will be the final excavation task. Recent experience has demonstrated that the advantages of the foundation pre-excavation procedure are manyfold. The drawing specifications and contract for the access roads and the foundation excavation can be made ahead of the final design of the dam and the other appurtenant structures, although these must be fairly well advanced. The excavation contract may be let six to 12 months ahead of the main dam for the dam construction. The bidding for the excavation contract can be quite competitive as local contractors can be pre-qualified. Many times, international contractors may also bid because they want to get their foot inside the door on this particular project. The bidding for the main dam contract will probably be lower and very competitive because the potential delays and cost associated with foundation excavation are no longer factors. Last but not least, a better foundation for the dam will probably have been achieved because of the spatial and focused attention devoted to this task. Panel, do you have comments on common and uncommon excavation methods? Don, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about the pre-excavation uh, separate contract. And uh, just note before I talk about a case history that, that we've used that in a couple of instances to show what does not exist at the site as well as to find out what does exist. And in terms of what doesn't exist at the site would be, for example, the trace of an active fault daylighting under the footprint of the dam. You can show conclusively that it's not there. The example I want to talk about is one in the desert southwest, uh, an embankment dam on a site of volcanic origin. Uh, that had several pre-construction contracts for the main dam. It had a contract for a concrete cutoff wall in the valley in order to accommodate some rock overhangs that were buried in the valley alluviums. The contract for pre-excavation included grouting the footprint of the dam. And even though fairly extensive boring and trenching explorations had gone on, the excavation uncovered some eroded joints that were vertical that went from upstream to downstream and uh, allowed us to put a secant cutoff through the area of the joints. It also allowed us to do some other special uh, fill treatments that we needed and exposed some unusual topography that would have been under the footprint of the dam that would not have been recognized through the uh, uh, common exploration methods that were used. I think that is a very good example. And uh, on the particular one that uh, you gave, I think that uh, also uh, uncovered by this uh, pre-excavation was a zone of scoriaceous, uh, weathered, very blocky lava. And uh, uh, the designers, upon studying it in detail, uh, decided that grouting would not be a permanent solution to cutting, uh, to cutting off the uh, reservoir leakage past the dam. And uh, they therefore preferred to go with some kind of cutoff wall, a positive cutoff wall, which they did by these overlapping secant piles. That's right. Don, we've uh, had quite a bit of experience in using the excava excavation for exploration as well. And really, it's uh, the, the primary way that we do projects on limestone. Um, the early preliminary or exploration using the techniques, uh, most of the ones that you've mentioned, will define the top of rock and the depth of the general depth of the foundation, uh, locate other uh, anomalies that are important, and help to design and locate the coffer cells. And then uh, the exploration 
is culminated in the final excavation, and, and really that's the only way that you can discover everything that needs to be treated in karstic limestone. There's really no other way to do it. We have two new locks uh, currently in the planning stages at existing projects, um, both on limestone, and both of these will be handled this way. Uh, both the schedules and the construction uh, contracts will be set up so that the exploratory work will be culminated in the expo excavations themselves and utilizing the same techniques that you've described. Well, Jim, I'm, I'm glad to, uh, to uh, hear that. I didn't, I didn't realize that uh, this was coming up. It sounds very interesting. Gus, I think you had a comment that you wanted to make on this uh, particular subject. Yes, I'd like to uh, echo again some of the words that uh, Jim has said with respect to the advantages of the pre-excavation. Uh, I know we, we had one project that uh, uh, we were looking at that um, was in the design stage and during the explorations uh, several borings were put down and a lot of information was developed. Uh, but then it was determined that additional borings were needed so that was done. Uh, as a result of that the board on the project uh, seeing the results of the borings determined that it would be best to have an open excavation and evaluate the, the geologic features. Uh, and uh, the, a contract was let to do this, and uh, it was done. And it was amazing that uh, there was a lot of information that was already known, but the open excavation certainly added m uh, many, many times uh, uh, m more information to what was uh, already known. And it made a big difference in the final design of the, of the dam before the contract was let. One of the other uh, fringe benefits of this, uh, I refer to as fringe benefits, the, uh, the one abutment um, uh, that had some potential problems in opening up, and they went up into the abutment, and uh, with respect to the design elevation of the crest of the dam, uh, it was pretty close as to whether they'd have a tie-out. And, uh, but this, this was determined uh, well uh, in advance of the, uh, of the uh, construction, and uh, the design incorporated all the features necessary to make it a, uh, a project that uh, would hold water, essentially. Well, so again, it turned out uh, to be a good experience. I think that was a, another good example of the benefits to be achieved from this uh, early and pre-excavation contract. And I think, gentlemen, there is a trend going. Don, what I'd like to, to offer is from the, the comments that we've heard is uh, the, the need to have the dam designer substantially involved uh, during the construction and very definitely the contract management, uh, particularly during the, the foundation exploration. It's, it's very important to be able to verify the design intent. Uh, uh, to this point, there's special emphasis within the federal guidelines for dam safety on the role and responsibility the designer should play during the dam construction. And uh, this role of the designer really needs to extend through the, uh, the excavation, through the construction, and actually monitoring the performance of the dam uh, during first filling uh, to be able to verify, once again, that the design intent has, has been carried out and that the dam is, is really performing as, as designed and as intended. I think that uh, in the past, this was definitely the case. Uh, it used to be that uh, most of the designers or the design firm or the design agency uh, were also the ones who were in charge of the field inspection uh, and the contract management. So there was this uh, continuity, at least in organizations, and usually uh, with the designer uh, having a chance to observe all of the final foundation treatment and all of the changes that might be involved and uh, be present uh, all the way during the construction and the, and, uh, the first uh, filling stages uh, for the reservoir. However, uh, probably a couple decades ago, uh, changes were made and a number of owners and owner agencies decided that to have more competition, uh, once they finished the design, they would go out for bids again for uh, the uh, supervision and uh, the construction control and construction management. So there became a time when those people who were hired were so jealous of their new role uh, that the designers were really not welcome. And many times changes were made in the design without consulting the original designer. Uh, 
this didn't happen too many times, but enough that it, is, it was of concern. Uh, so uh, I, I, I think that the designer of the dam must be kept aboard, uh, even though he may only be in the field with a small office and a staff of three or four people, he's able to follow all the way through any changing conditions or any uh, uh, design changes that might be necessary, and he can do it under the context of a background of experience on that particular design.